Okay, last week I did a sutta number 13, which was the the greater discourse on the mass of suffering. This week, I'm going to do sutta number 14, which is the shorter discourse on the mass of suffering. Now, an interesting thing that happens with the suttas, when you have a greater, greater discourse, it's not very long. But when you have a shorter discourse, it's quite a bit bigger. And why that is, I haven't been able to figure out. Anyway. <clears throat> Thus have I heard on, yeah. Okay. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country of Kapbilavatu in Negrotas Park. Then Mahanama, the Sakyan, Mahanama, uh, when the Buddha's father died, Mahanama took over for him. <sighs> So Mahanama the Sakyan went to the Blessed One after paying homage to him, sat down at one side and said, Venerable Sir, I have long understood the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One thus. Greed is an imperfection that defiles mind. Hate is an imperfection that defiles mind. Delusion is an imperfection that defiles mind defiles mind. Now again, every time you hear greed, hate, and delusion, that is another way of describing craving. Now in the uh, in the Zen tradition, they call that the three poisons. But to be quite honest, it's not three poisons, it's one. So there is a problem with that. If you don't really understand that greed, hatred, and delusion is another way of describing craving. Yet, while I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One thus, at times states of greed, hatred, and delusion invade my mind and remain. I have wondered, Venerable Sir, what state is still abandoned by me internally, owing to which at times these states of greed, hate, and delusion invade my mind and remain? Good question. Mahanama, there is still a state unabandoned by you internally owing to which at times the states of greed, hatred, and delusion invade your mind and remain. For were that state already abandoning you internally, you would not be living the home life. You would not be enjoying sensual pleasures. It is because that state is unabandoned by you internally that you are living the home life and enjoying sensual pleasures. Even though a noble disciple has seen clearly as it actually is with proper wisdom, how sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and much despair and how great is the danger in them as long as he still does not attend, 
attain to the rapture and pleasure that are apart from sensual pleasures, apart from unwholesome states, or to something more peaceful than that, he may still be attracted to sensual pleasures. But when a noble disciple has seen clearly as it actually is with proper wisdom, how sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and much despair, how great is the danger in them. He attains to the rapture and joy that are apart from the sensual pleasures, apart from unwholesome states, and to something more peaceful than that. That's why he is no longer attracted to sensual pleasures. Now, what are we talking about here? Getting into a jhana. When you experience the jhana and you stay in that state, your mind is pure. Now, how do you get to a pure mind? By using the six R's and developing your mind so that you can be in a jhana even while you're doing your daily activities. An awful lot of people have the idea that jhana uh, suppresses the hindrances. But when you're practicing twim, like I'm teaching you, you can practice staying in a jhana the whole time. If you're practicing one-pointed concentration, that does suppress the hindrances while you have this deep concentration. So the jhana is not about concentration. It's about understanding the different levels of wisdom and how you can keep that level with you all the time. But you have to do a few things. One, you have to start smiling more. Why? Because the smile improves your mindfulness. And again, mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. So you can see a hindrance when your mindfulness gets a little bit weak for whatever reason. You can start seeing a hindrance arise. The greed, hate, and delusion that craving. And you can use the six R's to let that go, to purify your mind. This is one of the reasons that I spend so much time trying to tell you about using the six, the six R's in your daily activities. You're going to become much more aware when you keep your precepts without breaking them. And when your mindfulness gets weak, you'll recognize that more quickly and let go of that when you use the six R's. So there is actually a method to my madness. as some people think I am really mad because I keep on talking about the same thing over and over and over again in different ways. I'm trying to get you to realize that you cause your own pain. You cause your own suffering. And the way to overcome that suffering is by using the six R's and changing your perspective. 
So you're able to see when an emotional state starts to come up. And the more you use the six R's with your daily activity, the deeper your sitting practice becomes because you're used to keeping the, keeping the six R's active. So it's a real important thing for you to realize that the more you use the six R's, the more you smile and have an uplifted mind, the less suffering you actually cause yourself. So keeping that smile means keeping your mind uplifted. And you become much more aware that when that hindrance arises, you can see it more clearly, more quickly, and let it go by using the six R's and relaxing that tension and tightness that greed, hatred, and delusion. You're letting it go much more quickly. And this leads to an uplifted mind all the time. Before my awakening, while I was still only an unawakened bodhisattva, I too clearly saw as it actually is with proper wisdom, how sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and much despair and how great is the danger in them. But as long as I still did not attain to the joy and happiness that are apart from sensual pleasures, apart from unwholesome states, or to something more peaceful than that, I recognize that I still could be attracted to sensual pleasures. But when I clearly saw, as it actually is with proper wisdom, how sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and much despair, and how great is the danger in them, and I attain to the joy and happiness that are apart from sensual pleasures, apart from unwholesome states or to something more peaceful. Now, the something more peaceful that is talking about here is getting into your equanimity. I did it. When you get into equanimity, you start to become disenchanted with sensual pleasures. Now, in Asia, being there for 12 years, I learned that all the Asians are very, very attached to food. And they have their favorite foods and they get excited and their mouth starts to get saliva in it and they really they look forward to being able to eat this delicious food well that's part of greed isn't it and if it doesn't meet their standard for the quality of food then you get into the hatred the aversion the dissatisfaction and you're identifying with those thoughts and feelings and causing yourself a lot of suffering. So the more you can really practice with your daily activities, using the six R's anytime your mind starts to stray and get involved in thinking about this and that and getting involved with it 
and making a big deal out of whether you get it or you don't get it, then your six R's are your savior. If I can use that word, I know it sounds kind of Christian, but they save you from the suffering that you get involved with when there is strong likes and dislikes. And it saves you from the worry and dissatisfaction of the first noble truth. Sometimes you get what you want and you're really happy. Other times you get what you don't want and you're really sad. But you're identifying with this. You're taking it personally. And the second noble truth is the cause of this suffering. And the cause of the suffering is always the craving. And the taking it personally. Many people ask the question about why am I on the wheel of Sansaro? What caused me to be there? And the thing that causes you to be in this in the odd in the wheel of Sansaro, that life death cycle, is because of making a big deal out of things, taking it personally getting upset because it doesn't happen the way you want it to, or it happens too much the way you want it to. And that guilty feeling or remorse is why the karma keeps you bound to the wheel of sansara, the life and death cycle. The more you can use the six R's with your daily activities, the more familiar you become with how the suffering arises and you start gaining more and more balance in your mind. you start gaining more disenchantment. And that's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that you can't enjoy things. You can see a beautiful flower or a piece of artwork that you very much like, and you could admire it and stay with it without thinking about it, then when you're done looking at it, when you walk away, you're not thinking about what you had seen, but you're staying in the present with what there is that arises next. The disenchantment takes the unwanted excitement out of life. But you can still very much admire when I was in, uh, when I was in India, I went to the Allura Caves where there was some of the most fantastic uh, stone architecture, stone carvings that I'd ever seen. And I very much admired them. And I stood a long time looking at them. But as soon as I walked away, they weren't there anymore. Everything changed. And then there was other things that caught my attention. So it's, it's a real necessary thing that you continue to use your six R's with your daily activities. And you'll, you'll start to notice that the things that used to bother you, that somebody else did continually, 
they don't bother you so much anymore. You're changing your perspective. Why get excited about that? It's no big deal. Okay. And as, as you continue doing that, all life becomes easier. Excuse me, I've got to take my coat off. It's starting to get warm in here. There. <clears throat> okay. And what is the gratification in the case of sensual pleasures? Mahanama, there are these five cords of sensual pleasures. Now this too is a danger in the case of sensual pleasures, a mass of suffering in, in, in the life to come. Having sensual pleasures as its cause, sensual pleasures as its source, sensual pleasures as its basis, the cause being simply sensual pleasures. Now, the, the difference between what almost all of the other meditation teachers are teaching you is this one step of relaxing, letting go of the tension and tightness in your mind and in your head. When you relax the tightness in your head, there's a feeling of expansion and very deep peace, but strong awareness. You're very alert. If you don't use that step of relaxing, you're bringing the craving back to your object of meditation. So you're not purifying your mind. And this is a major thing. There are a lot of people that do some meditation in one way or another. And they kind of complain about hitting a wall. They, go, they went so far and that's as far as they're, they're uh, going to go with that meditation. With what I'm showing you about using the relaxed step and the six R's, is that there's no more walls. You can continually go deeper and deeper in your meditation. Now, I, I have a lot of students that have been doing meditation for many, many years. And they had had before I started teaching this, they had complained about just going so far. And they got into a rut. They got into the idea that this is where they're going to go for their meditation. Sometimes they do a meditation for one month, sometimes uh, one month a year. Sometimes it was two weeks for a year. But they got into a rut of expecting the meditation just to go this far. And then they, they came and started complaining to me about it and I started showing them how to use the six R's. And I don't hear that sort of thing uh, so often anymore. I don't hear the complaint that they're, they're stuck in the rut and they just go so far and there's nothing else to see. Now, when you get into, let's say, neither perception nor non-perception, your mind is a very quiet space, but there are still some things that can arise. And you need to teach yourself not to make a big deal of what it is that arose. Now, I've, I've had some people tell me how bored they are because they're watching nothing. And what is the cause of that? 
they're bored because their mindfulness went away. They're taking it personally. They're expecting something else. And they don't see this expectation as a hindrance, which it is. And they'll cut their meditation short. I had one student that she was a great meditator getting up to that realm. And then she would sit for about an hour in neither perception nor non-perception where there is no problem at all. And then she started getting hit with the boredom and she would break her sitting and get up and start doing stuff. But she did this for about three years. And I was trying all different ways to get her to understand there's still more that's deeper than what she had expected. And I was get, trying to get her to realize that uh, she just expected to get to this state. There was nothing that for her to see. So, well, I've got other things I'd rather be doing. Finally, I had to threaten her and tell her I wasn't going to be her teacher anymore unless she started following what I was telling her. That she had to sit for three hours or longer. And I gave her one chance. I said, it's either that or you can go find another teacher. And she did it. And she was amazed at how much more she understood the meditation. She was amazed at the use of the six R's. And she was seeing how the boredom is just another form of a hindrance. So There is no wall that you're going to hit except the walls that you put up for yourself. Well, I sit every day, I sit for two hours, and it's always the same. Well, I'm sorry, it's never the same. It's always different. Everything in life is part of impermanence. It's changing. It's a little different. And you have to have this quiet mind to be able to see that difference. And how you can have all of a sudden your mind gets to a certain place and it, it just takes a step down and goes deeper and, and you're, you're shocked when you see that. Well, why did that happen? Because you let go of your expectation. You let go of thinking that things are always going to stay the same. So it's, it's pretty amazing to watch when people come to me and then, then they'll say, you know, I finally started sitting longer and there's a lot more to see. I had no idea. Yeah, that's really true. Now, Mahanama, on one occasion, I was living at Rajagaha on the mountain of Vulture's Peak. On that occasion, a number of Nigantas living on the Black Rock on the slopes of Isagili were practicing continuous standing, rejecting seats, were experiencing painful, racking, piercing feeling due to exertion. I don't know if you've ever tried doing a, a standing meditation. If you do a standing meditation, you need to be standing 
by something so you can put your hand on it and keep your balance because it's very easy to lose your balance when you're doing the standing meditation. And I did that in, uh, I think I was in Thailand at the time. It might have been Malaysia, I'm not sure. But I, I've been standing for about an hour without moving and there's real uh, burning in the feet that start to happen. And it gets quite unpleasant. And while I was doing the standing meditation, there was, it was a non-poisonous snake, but a snake started to come up my leg. And I wasn't particularly uh, enthusiastic about that happening. So I bent over and I put my hand down like this. And I said, no, you, you have to go someplace else. And the snake turned around and left. Not a pleasant experience. So I decided that if I was going to do a standing meditation, I would do it inside rather than outside. Anyway. There are a lot of painful, racking, piercing feelings due to the exertion of standing in one place and not moving. Then when it was evening, I rose from meditation and went to the Niganthas there. I asked them, friends, why do you practice continuous standing? rejecting seats and experience painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion. When this was said, they replied, friend, the Niganta Naputa is omnipotent and all-seeing and claims to have complete knowledge and vision thus, whether I am walking Uh, pages stuck together. Standing asleep or awake, knowledge and vision are continuously, uninterruptedly present in me. He says thus, Niganthas, you have done evil actions in the past. Exhaust them with the performance of piercing austerities. And when you are here and now restrained in body, speech, and mind, that is doing no evil actions for the future. So by annihilating with asceticism past actions and by doing no fresh actions, there will be no consequence in the future. So that's how they thought they were purifying themselves by doing this practice. Now, every 10 years, all of the holy men get together along the Ganges. And for about, I guess it's about two months, something like that, uh, they get together and discuss their own practice and show off their practices. And I, I haven't seen that personally, but I saw Newsweek that they were doing a story on that. And they showed a guy that had been standing on one leg only. He had his other leg pulled up into his groin area. And he'd been doing that for a month. And he thought he was going to become awakened because of that, because of the extreme pain that happened. He didn't break that. Even when he slept, he slept in a standing posture. That's what it said in, in the newscast. I'm not sure whether that's really true or not. So that was, that was why they were doing these austerities. You hear austerities of people laying down on nail beds and uh, 
on the hottest day of the year, they put fires all around them and stayed in the middle so that they suffered. And then when it was cold season, they would go up into the mountains and, and stay with nothing but a loincloth in this cold, shadowy place. And they think that they can get awakened by causing these kind of pains so that they can go beyond the pain. That doesn't work. But that's their belief. With no consequence in the future, there is the destruction of action. With the destruction of action, there is destruction of suffering. With the destruction of suffering, there is the destruction of feeling. With the destruction of feeling, all suffering will be exhausted. This is the doctrine we approve and accept, and we have, are satisfied with it. So what's the Buddha going to say to that? Been there, done that, doesn't work. And some, some of these guys with their austerities, they, they hold their hand up above their head all the time. And after a period of time, the blood starts to settle and doesn't go up into the hand anymore. And it gets extremely painful. And if they bring their, their hand down, it's uh, the blood getting to the, uh, to the arm uh, that's really very, very painful. Tried it for about one day decided that doesn't work. But I'm somebody that doesn't particularly like to have pain. That's why when I tell, tell you to sit, you can sit on the floor if you want. And I told this to a lot of people in India, they're used to sitting on the floor and they can sit for 15 or 20 minutes and then they start moving around because it's uncomfortable. So I say, well, don't sit on the floor, sit on a cushion or sit on a chair. And they have this idea in India that if you sit in a chair, you, you can't meditate. And they were completely surprised when they didn't have a lot of pain and they could sit still for longer and longer periods of time. And they felt like they were progressing in the meditation. And they were. When I was told by my teacher that I should be sitting more than four hours without moving, and I started doing that, there was such extreme pain, it was unbelievable. And that would last for an hour, hour and a half, sometimes two hours, and then that pain would go away and I'd, I'd be able to sit for even longer without any pain. But then I would finally get up and start walking very, very slowly because the pain had come back. There was just a, a short period of time that there was no pain, maybe an hour or so. And then the pain came back and I, I couldn't see the advantage of continually sitting in this pain. This is why I have big problems with my legs right now because of sitting and forcing myself to sit. When I was sitting on the floor, I was forcing myself to sit for long periods of time and I developed blood clots of which there's still after 20 years of trying to fix it there's still problems with my legs. 
anyway. When this was said, I told them, but friends, do you know that you existed in the past and that it is not the case that you did not exist? No, friend. But friend, do you know that you did evil actions in the past and did not abstain from, it, from them? No, friend. But friends, do you know that you did such and such evil actions? No, friend. But friends, do you know that so much suffering has already been exhausted? or that so much suffering has still to be exhausted, or that when so much suffering has been exhausted, all suffering that will have been exhausted? No, friend, but friends, do you know what the abandoning of unwholesome states is? and what the cultivation of wholesome states is here and now? So he asked him all these questions. Are you taking this on blind faith? Or do you know from your direct experience? And they didn't know from their direct experience. They were just believing what their, quote, guru said. Now, this is one of the reasons that I try to tell you and when you're in retreat over and over again is that you don't need a guru. You are your own teacher. You're teaching yourself what wholesome is, what unwholesome is. You're teaching yourself more and more clearly how this process of what we call life actually works. And you're teaching yourself. So you don't have to blindly follow what the guru says. A lot of people, they get very caught up in their loyalty to the guru. And I'll do anything that he says. But is there advantage to that? It might be the right path you're on. It might not be. How do you know? You know through your own direct experience. That's what the meditation is here to teach you. How to teach yourself. When you see that you're causing yourself pain and suffering, What's the best way to let it go? Laugh? Um, sorry, I just heard a bell. Is, is that one of the ways that you can let go of your pain and suffering? Well, yeah. Along with using your six R's. So I try to encourage you to, with your daily activity, I want you to smile more. And I'm not talking about smiling with your lips. I'm talking about smiling in your mind. Lightly, lightly smile with your mind. That improves your mindfulness. You see more and more clearly when a hindrance starts to arise, you can let it go without getting involved with it. Now, a hindrance is a hindrance because you, you break this simple recommendation and you take it personally and that causes more and more suffering. You start to teach yourself more and more clearly 
the need to keep your precepts without breaking them. Oh, I know one man that he said when he was very young, a, a kitten got run over by a car, but it was still awake. And he thought that it was compassionate to kill the chicken or kill the kitten. So he took the kitten to a bucket of water, started to put the kitten in the bucket of water and got scratched very, very deeply. But he still carried on with that belief. And to this day, he is suffering because of that identification with the wrong belief in a personal self. So the more you can keep your precepts and you will start teaching yourself more and more about the necessity of keeping your precepts. The closer you keep your precepts, when you start sitting in meditation, your mind goes very deep, very quickly. And that's one of the advantages of keeping that. So, so friend, it seems that you do not know that you existed in the past. And that is not the case that you did not exist or that you did evil actions in the past and did not abstain from them or that you did such and such evil actions or that so much suffering has already been exhausted or that so much suffering still has to be exhausted or when that so much suffering has been exhausted all suffering will have been exhausted or what the abandoning of unwholesome states is. This is pretty amazing. And what the cultivation of wholesome states is here and now. That being so, those who are murderers, bloody-handed evildoers in the world when they are reborn among human beings, go forth into the homelessness as Nigantas. Friend Gotama, pleasure is not to be gained through pleasure. Pleasure is to be gained through pain. Interesting idea. So, I had one student that he called me up one time and he started telling me about how he was suffering with his hindrances and how he really got into the pain of it. So I told him, oh, good. You want pain? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to take your shoes and socks off. I want you to walk outside and find a nice sized tree and kick it as hard as you can with your toes. Then you're going to know what pain is. And when I told him to do that, he started laughing at how absurd it was. And as soon as he laughed, he didn't have the hindrance. It faded away. And I told him, now you use your six R's. And he was very thankful for that, that lesson. I was, I was really anxious to see what, if he would do it. <laughs> but you got to, sometimes you have to recommend uh, as a guide, you have to recommend some things that are 
completely bizarre so that you can see whether the person is willing to do it or not. Or they'll use that as a lesson to uh, see the absurdity of the whole thing. For when were pleasure to be gained through pleasure, then King Bimbasara of Magadha would gain pleasure since he abides in greater pleasure than any general, than any, than, than the venerable Gotama, excuse me. Surely the venerable Nagantas uh, this is a, a sect that's still alive in in India, and they they really do get off on causing themselves all kinds of severe asceticism, and it's very painful the things that they come up with. When it comes time, they have certain times of the year that they stop eating. And then they start eating after a couple of weeks, and then they eat uh, one, one, go to one place for alms round, and eat one small bowl of rice or whatever is is offered. And then they start working it up to two places, then to three, and up to seven, and they gain back their strength. But it's a very painful kind of practice. Not highly recommended. Surely the venerable Nagantas have uttered those words rashly without reflection. Rather it is I who taught to be asked. Who abides in greater pleasure? King Bimbasara of Magadha or the Venerable Gotama. Surely, friend Gotama, we utter these words rashly and without reflection. But let that be. Now we ask the Venerable Gotama, who abides in greater pleasure? King Bimbasara of Magadha or the Venerable Gotama? Then, friend, I shall ask you a question in return. Answer as you like. What do you think, friends? Can King Bimbasara of Magadha abide without moving his body or uttering a word, experiencing the peak of pleasure for seven days and nights? Interesting question. No, venerable sir, can King Bimbasara of Magadha abide without moving his body or utter a word experiencing the peak of pleasure for six, five, four, three, two, one day and night? No, friend, but friend, I can abide without moving my body or uttering a word, experiencing the peak of pleasure for one day and night, for two, three, four, five, six nights, for seven days and seven nights. What do you think, friends? That being so, who dwells in the greater pleasure, King Bimbasara of Magadha or I? Now he's talking about getting into Niroda Samapati. And this is a state that has no consciousness in it. So this is like the highest kind of relief that you can experience. And when you sit for a long period of time and you come out of that state, it's like you've only been sitting for 10 or 20 minutes. And 
your mind is exceptionally clear and bright and alert and the radiance that comes off of your face is very bright it's quite an interesting experience i'm not saying that i have that experience i'm just saying it's an interesting experience I asked uh, one of my teachers, Deepama, why do you do that? Why do you sit for seven days without moving? And she said, one word, relief. Think of all the relief of not having thoughts distracting you. not having any disturbance distract you. And your body is very well healthy. Makes me think I want to have that happen right now. Maybe we'll try. <laughs> but your mind is so clear. It's like your mind got erased from all the things that are worldly and bothered you. Now you sit in this state for a long period of time. It is the highest pleasure that you can experience. Okay. That being so, the venerable Gotama abides in greater pleasure than the King Bimbisara of Magadha. That's what the Blessed One said, Mahanama of the, the Sakyans was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. An interesting thing with uh, Mahanama as the king's father was dying on his bed, they were looking for somebody to take his place and they were thinking maybe it was uh, Devadatta would take his place. But instead of being there with the, his, his, fa his father, uh, he went to a pleasure garden and he started drinking alcohol and gallivanting around and then came back just as his father was dying and his father saw, saw what a mess he was and he declined to allow Devadatta to uh, become king. Mahanama at that time was with the Buddha the whole time that the Buddha was with his father. He was a monk. He had ordained. And after the king's father died, the Buddha said, we have to, we have to find someone to take his place that is very moral and upstanding and that people would follow him as long as he was doing wholesome things. And they couldn't think of anyone. And then the Buddha gave the suggestion that Mahanama disrobe and take over as the king of the realm. And he did. So you hear stories about Mahanama and other suttas. That is so that you understand that he was now king and he, he ruled very righteously over, uh, over the realms that, that he had his kingdom. Little story along, alongside uh, So you have some information about who some of these different people are. Then let's share some merit.
May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad, sad. So have a good week. Keep your six hours rolling along, okay? Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante.